show you today. Let me see where my plan is. It's here. Okay, so I'm gonna check out my plan. Uh, and there you can see basically my notes. Um, the start I want to talk to you guys about. And I'm gonna share these um, after the thing. And if you have questions about how any of these things work, uh, please ask me. I am not gonna be showing you scenes today because you know, in production, you can't really show scenes. But I'm gonna try to break it down into simple things that usually is what happens in production. So in a real movie, you have basic concepts that you apply, but there's a lot of adjustments on top of them and a lot of layering. So nothing to really be afraid of. Uh, it's all the work, but end up with something nice. So the key to ending, ending up with something nice is that you have very solid basics and you can layer them and listen to your teammates and be a good team player. That's basically all it is. So you can see here in our reel, it has a big bunch of um, snowy stuff. Let me just make all of these a bit less cluttered, a bit less cluttered. So I can maybe, so I can maybe see a little bit better. Okay, and so lots of snowy um, stuff, some destruction here in this shot, and some some other uh, stuff, some other destruction stuff here, and. Um, there was some, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get, get to it. Some areas with, where we experimented a lot because the stuff that we started with didn't seem to be working. So we end up with a few different options and setups. Uh, and you can see that there is a big bunch of shots which are happening outside. So um, our guys have just kind of been blown out of the Shanghai Tower, and they are kind of making their way down the. Uh, snowy slopes just out uh, of the uh, ramp that they uh, are entering the, the, the tower with. And uh, there is some drama where some of them are getting left, like one guy is getting left inside. So um, this escape is basically our sequence. And um, there is uh, several groups of shots. So one of them is the exterior stuff, which is shot like shots like this one. Uh, then there's uh, some shots which are close-ups, uh, this one and this one. Uh, then there's this shot which is kind of separate on its own, which has the exterior but with uh, the destruction stuff, and there is the interior shot, show, shot with the destruction stuff. So uh, if you go to look at the uh, these uh, exterior snowy shots, and I'm just going to see where they end, and I'm just going to loop that, maybe here. Uh, so here, what was the main challenge was um, breaking the snow slopes. And snow slopes turn out to be very tricky to break because unlike something that is solid, you know, got ground, earth, uh, concrete, wood, whatever, this is translucent. And translucent things are just inherently much more difficult because you can see through the snow and we tried to get uh, to kind of ignore that uh, and to uh, say uh, get the snowy look with some other other means, but it doesn't really work. You always need this subsurface scattering uh, for things to look nice and and deep and to have the uh, the snowy type of shadows. And yeah, Tari and I also love snow. Uh, I'm, I'm a skier. Uh, I'm looking at a lot of snow <laughs> very often. So you know, I, nobody wants to have bad snow. Bad snow is you know. Not tasty, it's not like bad ice cream, which can be good. But uh, bad snow is almost never good. So um, it was difficult to get all of these things uh, together with the, um, something that is making things simpler for breaking. So pre-breaking, you can always see the, um, the edges. Uh, they always too straight, so you need displacement. You don't want displacement on the top side because we are having separate displacement on the top side, which is much too detailed for to use it everywhere. It's breaking up on the edges because the UVs are not consistent where you break. So for example, you can see, I think on a shot like this one, how much of uh, stuff is actually CG. So we end up replacing basically everything besides the characters. And the slope that you can see here is, can I, yeah. 
if I go a bit like that, because that's something some, that sometimes uh, something that we do that we increase the contrast a lot just to be able to see things more clearly. Uh, so the displacement that we that we use here is not the same as the displacement that we use on the plate on the on the areas that, that are cut. So we need se separate displacements. They need to show up at the right moment. Uh, you need to add a lot of stuff on the edge. So uh, these things were just making our life difficult, but eventually we <laughs> rendered up a lot of different elements. So um, the stuff which is getting destroyed is rendered uh, in several uh, in several kind of layers. So so the comp guys do a lot of the blending because otherwise it would be quite difficult with these slopes. And we tried a lot of stuff like uh, give them velocity masks and um, kind of some other masks. I struggling to remember some depths and um, the distances to uh, the particles which were activating the snow. Uh, but basically, we had this big kind of snow color this uh, slope, and we made a cylinder on the top. So if the if the snow color is kind of like this. That's where the guys are rolling down, like here. And then we have geometry which is covering this here area. And over time, we measure distance of each fragment of these pretty broken slopes. So imagine all this has, you know, these broken chunks. And over time, we measure the distance between this chunk and the slope. And uh, we activate after the distance, when the distance is this much. And we increase the this much over time. So uh, first we activate this one, and this, one, then this one, then this, and this, and this is kind of spreading out from the from this surface, which is nice because we couldn't make it work with just distance to a point. So this is the next uh, kind of uh, most efficient thing that you can do. Usually we you, you can activate just by distance to a helper or to a particle, uh, but this is always a sphere. So when you want to have some more specific surface, then that's uh, something that is very helpful. Um, and it's not that slow to calculate. Keep your geometry is not too heavy. Um, you only calculate once per particle. So uh, when geometry is light and uh, particles are not too many, then you're going to be fine. Now, out of these areas, we fragment second time just so we have something in, in between all of the chunks. So you never want to, you never want to have your chunks so like let's say this is one chunk and this is the other chunk so you don't want to have this ever so you don't want to have the chunk and the next chunk uh, share an edge so you want to have some uh, a piece in between them and you want to break this piece up so then when these two big chunks fall apart there's going to be a bunch of stuff in the middle that you can additionally break and uh, they can you can make st the stick to the to the bigger pieces, but this is helping you out in avoiding these clean edges, which look very bad. So we try to avoid this a lot, and a lot of times the easiest way that you can do that is that let's say you have a big area that you have broken up, you know, into pieces, and sometimes you can just say, okay, just break half of these pieces. So you're going to end up this is going to be broken, and this is going to be broken, and this is going to be broken, and this is not going to be broken. So most of the time you're going to have an, a broken edge between pieces. So sometimes you're going to have an edge like that. And you just see and you find a, a good random seed which works. Uh, if you don't do that, then uh, you emit also particles on the edges, which actually you always do. Um, when they start moving, you start emitting these particles from the edge. Um, sometimes it helps to limit this emission to the surface. So if you have uh, something which is flat, so let's imagine we are looking at things from the side now. So this is the depth thing here. And you have your pieces are being like this, let's say. So you don't want to emit, you know, here and here and here. And you want to emit over here where it matters. You want to dirty up this edge so it's not clean. And when you have a flat surface, it's very easy. and. It actually happens a lot because a lot of times you are breaking the ground, which is kind of at zero and flat. So you just delete everything which is below a certain threshold. So this is, is going to get killed. 
and if the surface is not flat if it's something like this like this and then let's say you have this which is getting broken um and you want to emit between like you want to emit here near the edge and not in, in depth then you create a copy of the surface which is uh, laying here and this really is, it's easy to do you can take a plane you can conform it to your surface and then shift it up just a little bit and you can use distance to nearest point on that plane with the geometry nodes and uh, geom point you have nearest uh, geom particle i think you have nearest uh, point to surface so uh, only at, at, at areas the particles that getting emitted um, near this surface are going to get uh, you know shapes and so on and all of the all, all of the other guys the guys who get emitted here these are going to get deleted because the distance is too high so just do this to the threshold uh, yeah plenty of these things and eventually um, you want to scale these particles with age because you don't want them to pop in uh, and you want to give your comping people uh, as much you know information because they're going to be saving you as all the places where things are kind of not not too sexy they they, they could add stuff and uh, give them enough information so they can can blend in between your different elements and they can uh, hide the things which are pleasant um, we had a lot of uh, comp work just blending in all the um, areas where we wanted the plate to show through uh, uh, versus where we wanted our CG things to show through and eventually we made the plate show through at areas where there was a lot of interaction between the character's feet and the plate and um, everything all the rest we removed the director didn't really like how the plate uh, snow was being shot but uh, some of the areas where there was interaction we really liked uh, and we committed them to, to keep because, you know, these things are making the whole thing uh, believable. And one of these very important um, uh, plate interactions was with this, uh, with this huge shovel that you can see here. So basically they, they just had this uh, part of the, of, the, of the canvas that, that the guys are rolling down on. Uh, connected to some wire and then they pulled it up uh, some Photoshop people coming in I don't have a camera because I can't share screen and have a camera but some Photoshop people coming in they see anyone say hi, Hello. hi. so the, they had um, they had this uh, part of the canvas uh, wired up with some cables and then they pulled it up and we thought okay yeah this is looking really good as something that can well, let me share my screen so they can also see uh, this is looking really good as something that can create an extra uh, you guys can see now right yeah okay yeah, yeah. Uh, so so this is something that can create extra interaction and we thought about what we can do to make something there which uh, is both spectacular and has the size and we said okay let's let's smash a big ice boulder in there and we <clears throat> created a, a kind of procedural ice boulder i'm going to get there also uh, it was kind of challenging though because you want to keep a lot of this <clears throat> a lot of this snow reaction uh, but it's difficult to find exactly the, the edge because it's such a soft and volumetric uh, thing uh, and eventually we made some soft masks uh, on the edges of this thing so we added here and there uh, parts of it and we want to uh, add, add the, the, them back from the plate especially around the characters we couldn't use too much of it because it was quite difficult to to mask out but the comp people just um, added it in the right places where it's interactive so um, where it counts basically you can have oh thanks so you can have more of it where it it's counts most... and and it was kind of tricky to have it smash very precisely where the all the all that stuff have where the kind of shovel action happens because you want it to be very close to the characters so it feels very dangerous but uh but you want it to not go at all over this boundary and we tried kind of colliding it with something but it's it, it looks too fake because it looks like it's colliding with something hard 
So we eventually uh, tweaked the speeds uh, carefully and we have a very soft force which is pushing it upwards up the slope in the in the in the beginning of the of its development and then the frictions and so on slowing it down but yeah uh, just some sh sh uh, soft push upwards then there was a big bunch of assets that we made to dress up the slope around the characters because uh, again that's something that we completely replaced uh, so there was some kind of interesting modeling work there because it's not as easy as it looks to make these cracked snow shapes, but eventually it kind of worked. Um, and something else which which was nice on the shovel was that uh, instead of kind of using the what we usually do kind of pre-break the geometry and then do the TP stuff on top. This time we actually just used VB and uh, shape and shape noises, and uh, this made it very quick uh, for us to see. It was much lighter uh, because it was obvious that getting enough geometry on this thing is going to be a challenge, uh, and the breaking up the edges uh, is going to be always looking insufficient. And especially if you want to have this thing going inside the simulation makes things too heavy. So we just simulated with uh, these Voronoi pieces that we shape uh, noise afterwards and filled up with a bunch of debris in, 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 the, in between and definitely a lot of snow powder on top, you know, both as smoke and as uh, tiny snowflakes which follow the smoke because just adding just smoke on top of it doesn't really work. Uh, you need the snowflakes that get a little bit and tell you that this is uh, snow. So yeah, this is, helped us a lot. The, the shape noise, post cache shape noise was really nice. Uh, and um, we emitted the snowflakes and, and, the, and the film, as I said, from the, from the edges, which was kind of uh, something that we do pretty much always. And there is another thing which is fun in this shot, and this is this rolling piece. And that's something that we kind of, I think, end up doing in all our shows almost. Whenever there is um, opportunity, like whenever there is a tilted surface, we always make something roll down because it looks so good. And generally, you want to have more of these spinning or rotational motions because they, they always look much better than just linear translational motions. If you have something that just falls, it's much less interesting than something which is kind of rolling and bouncing. And in uh, in, in another movie that we did, we had a, uh, we had a ship which was which was cup, in a cup-sized kind of uh, orientation and we rolled some a bunch of things on top of the deck and we of course set them on fire. So besides rolling things, it's cool when you add dynamic elements to them. So now uh, in this other situation we set it on fire and this situation we just have a bunch of snowy powder that is getting emitted from it and this is making something which might otherwise be kind of boring shot. It's making it into something that is interesting to watch and fun. So uh, it was uh, <coughs> it was kind of tricky to to see okay what are we gonna just uh, are we gonna roll down here and we have so many ice boulders and we have one on the left which is huge so we said okay we don't want another ice boulder so now we just piled some stuff that we had from the uh, guys who are modeling the debris that is coming from the building and we added some spherical distorted shapes to have this, these clumps and we ended up with a bunch of junk and uh, it actually worked. And of course we didn't really sim with all the with all the, the this bunch of junk. I think we simmed with a, some kind of a simple s spherical shape that was just easy to make a roll down. Uh, you want to control how it rolls, you know, the speed and how much it turns, how much it stops and like push it maybe for, uh, here and there because you don't want it to roll with the same speed and uh, in the same direction all the time. So we simulate with that, uh, with that spherical thing and we just pay attached the, all of this junk to the sphere. And eventually uh, we, do, we drop it off uh, from, the, from the attachments and we use a lot of probabilities actually. So uh, when you want stuff to kind of gradually happen over time and you have a system that have a, has a bunch of factors in it, and you want to some of them stuff to happen and then to another one, to another one. So over time kind of gradually uh, make things kind of take over that system. So in this case, you want things to fall off from this, uh, 
from this uh, ball of junk. <clears throat> and otherwise, uh, other times you would debris to kind of over time uh, fall off one after the other from a building or something like that. Uh, so this we use probabilities for this. So you just get a random node that generates something every frame and uh, hook it up to a threshold node. And when you basically roll a dice for each particle, each frame like that, and when you make the probability, you know, right, then you have some particles uh, rolling the right kind of dice uh, earlier than otherwise uh, other, others are doing this later. And if you want to be even more precise, you can make a timer and you can assign an each particle, you know, a value, a, a frames value. And then after this timer runs out, uh, you can release the particle. So this is giving you a little bit, it's a little bit more setup for a little bit more control. Uh, when you want all of the um, things to have happened until some frame. Uh, but usually we don't do that because we always want uh, some some of the actors, some of the particles to remain in the original state. So this is a bit more natural So and simpler to set. Um, and of course, we couldn't really get away with just the rigid bodies here. So uh, whenever the pieces are near the ground, how uh, we shoot array downwards. So if I can draw again, um, let me see if I can actually draw on the right kind of frame. So let's say here, um, whenever we have a piece, which is, oh, sorry, uh, the pieces which are near the ground, uh, we have, let's say, let's say the slope is like this. And then you have a, a few pieces here from this junk ball. So we shoot array down from each piece. Get the distance here of the ray, and when the distance is low <clears throat> and the, the, the particle is still in the group which is p attached and not released yet, we emit few meters, and they get the uh, the velocity of the of the particle, and we add some um, artificial velocity, which is uh, if you now imagine that we are looking from the top, okay, from here even. So this is the center of the of the of the of the junk ball, <clears throat> which is basically the pivot of the particle which is, that is rolling down the simple sphere. So we get this distance like this between the center and, and, and this particle and we get rid of the Z component. So we flatten it. So it, it's kind of only, it has only horizontal values. And we amplify this a lot. So we multiply this by like, let's say that. And we use this for the initial velocity. So if you look from the top, that's something that looks like like the ball is here and you have stuff which is going this way. Um, and you can do stuff with the velocity of, of this dude if you want to only have these things happening forward. Um, if you if you do a, a dot product, you can find uh, between the velocity of this guy and this velocity, you can find how much these things are collinear. So how much they point in the same direction. And um, then you can say, okay, only uh, if if this thing, if you find these dudes pointing in the other direction, which means that this this is a is a negative value uh, that you get from the load product, you just delete them. If it's a positive value, uh, you you just leave it. So this this way you can make them only uh, happen forward and sideways and not backwards. Sometimes it's annoying to have them uh, go backwards. Uh, so yeah, these emit uh, the fume effects which you then may, might collide with some of these um, particles. And that makes it, <laughs> gives this an additional layer, uh, which is integrating it. And uh, when you have two types of dynamics, always looks a little bit better, or much better, actually. OK, so that was that. Um, then we have a lot of debris showers in all of these shots. Um, so because the whole building is collapsing and we want to have this um, kind of apocalyptic, dramatic uh, feeling to all these shots. <laughs> you see debris are falling um, all the time, pretty much in all of these exterior shots, but in the interior ones also. So these things are kind of simple, which was good, but they had to be crafted uh, because so much of them are very close to the characters and we have several different layers basically so we have some that are very near to the camera we have some that are around the characters we have some that are 
kind of behind in the background, creating atmosphere. And these are um, behaving differently, each one of them, because we uh, had we wanted to force the feeling a little bit uh, when we when we did it just as it should be. It was feeling a bit um, strange, like the. One, the, the pieces which were very near to the camera, they went by too fast to kind of realize what's going on. So we we kind of amplified the slow motion effect uh, and we made it, which makes things a little bit more dramatic. And while it's, it is simpler uh, to deal with these pieces, which are uh, both in very near and very far from the character from the characters, because they don't interact really with the ground and so on. There were pieces which are hitting that we, we that we wanted to uh, make hit the ground because otherwise you get this kind of theater curtains effect that there is stuff in front of the camera and there's things behind but in the middle nothing happens so we want we knew that we had we should uh, make a lot of them hit the ground and we end up with these funny looking kind of bombs that are falling around them which makes the whole scene much more dangerous because otherwise if they just uh, are kind of rolling down the hill, it's not as dangerous as if they're getting bombarded by these pieces and they not really escape. Uh, so uh, it was interesting to figure out what shapes these things uh, have to be. And we tried with some uh, with different kinds of shapes that kind of belonged to a building, but a lot of them were these long, narrow shapes, which didn't really work. So eventually we picked up on two shapes that worked uh, and one of them is the ice boulder kind of thing and the other one is um, an agglomeration of twisted metal and um, and and uh, some concrete and some ice uh, so we use this a lot for the close-up uh, pieces that are falling but also you can see some of them in the background and the ones which are hitting the ground and kind of exploding it this was more fitting to be this uh, big icy just threatening heavy looking chunks some of them are not you know just for interest but most of, the, of them are um, and we saw that we have to create uh, variations of these pieces so uh, so yeah i won't I, I so i thought okay let's do some procedural sit up there because uh, it would take too long to model all of these variations and we wanted to have options for the director to choose. So what we did was that we uh, put some particles inside the volume, inside the volume, and the volume was this very, very few um, segments uh, geosphere, and the very few segments allowed us to have something which is which has straight edges. So it was something like you know like this or something like. Like that, we we put a lot of noise on top, but it was very important to have these edges that are that are straight, um, because if you start up with a with something which has more segments, which is more round, you displace it and you end up with different shapes. But they are either oblong shapes, when like pear-like shapes, when you have low resolution on the uh, displacement uh, texture or if uh, or low frequency sorry but and if you have higher frequency they become you know cauliflowery shapes but you never get the straight edge and it was it, it didn't feel like ice you know it felt that if it should be icy it should have some edges which were quite straight so we ended up with these very few segments and then we filled this up with points uh, so what this allows us to do is the other thing is that we don't just want to displace because always when you displace you end up with these kind of connected shapes so it it looks like it's not something that is broken off from somewhere because all of its um, all the protrusions are the same style and all of the indentations are the same style so instead of doing that we actually wanted to cut it to cut things out of it but do it in a volumetric way so uh we, when you when you apply texture to this you can do like something like this and you know like this and you get cuts and the the resulting object is much more interesting and because it's 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 a volume 
the this cutting happens at different places sometimes it happens in the middle of the actual object so you get something which is a bit hollow then other times it happens on the surface and you get this kind of eaten up meteory much more complicated surfaces and on top of this you can then displace with a higher frequency uh, noise but this is looking uh, so much better and because all of these things is a texture uh, which is in world space and this noisy uh, very simple geosphere you can simply move it to another place in space and get a different looking meteor so you know if you if you move it over here you're gonna end up with something like this so eventually you're not gonna have many of these stages you're gonna have just maybe one or two the rest is gonna get eaten up but just because you can move it and get a different seed we made, made up a max script which is taking these emitters and just creating a chessboard um, just moving them around and each of these things then got its own setup and we ended up with you know as many variations of these uh, bouldery rocks as we wanted to have and uh, all of them we discard because they don't happen to be interesting random seeds but then we keep you know like let's say half a dozen from a 60 batch or from like a 20 batch and then we do a few batches and we end up with a with a nice uh kit bash of rocks which is quite good uh, so to do this we used krakatoa and frost so with krakatoa we fill up the uh the objects with particles inside and with frost we uh, we mesh them then the, yeah, before that with Krakatoa, we delete the uh, the ones which have a lower value in, in a texture uh, inside, so we get the, the eaten up kind of feeling. Very useful and something that we do um, in one way or another quite often. So let me check off things on my list. Uh, yeah, so this was the these guys. Okay, let me, I'm going to leave it just if somebody wants to. <laughs> to, 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 to remind themselves of something over there. Uh, okay, so... Uh, but eventually, yeah, these pieces, <laughs> we wanted to, to have some splashes when they hit the ground to make things more fun. Let me find a place where we have some interesting ones. Let's say in this shot. okay here so <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> something's wrong with my throat uh summer's been winter's been no it's not gonna help water yeah sorry <clears throat> so what we wanted to have is that is these splashes which are kind of exploding from where it hit where, where the piece hits the ground and we didn't want to cover the geometry too much because you don't want to just end up with a, with a big puff uh, but you don't want to have pretty much any of the area where the object hits the ground showing so we did exactly the same thing that i was this i was telling you about when the uh, roller happens so uh, the the object hits the ground and then we create a bunch of particles on this on its surface like that and we uh, take the distance between these particles and the center of the object we multiply it by x and y being one and z being zero so we just get rid of all of their the, the vertical information if you look at it from the side so let's say this is from the top if you look at it from the side okay so this is the slope and then this is the this is the piece so we have all of these particles and each one of them let's see this is the center so you get end up with these directions like that like a hedgehog you know and if you if you delete all of the z uh, information you all all of these things are going to be flat so you're going to end up with just these directions there's going to be no z's but if you look from the top they're still going to look like this because all the horizontal information is preserved so there we, get, we can get this information we just give them random z's so you have some of them are like that and the other ones are like that and on the other side also 
So you end up with this kind of splash and because the particles are here, so there is nothing inside. Okay, so it ends up looking, merci, merci. so it ends up looking something like this, which is exactly your splash emitter. Uh, it's very simple, you know, it takes like, yeah, one, one distance and one multiply uh, one, one point three node and you have your kind of sideways splash. Then again, you can uh, influence it with the velocity of this guy. We always want to inherit velocities because you never want things to just appear into space from nothing. And um, when they get, get, they're getting emitted by something which is moving, they kind of fall behind. So you always want to inherit the velocity of the, of the moving thing. Uh, but that's the basic way we do our splash emissions. Um, you can also use a texture to multiply the, them by something if you want to create some diversity. But a lot of times we just uh, and we just see them in two in two layers, um, which is make an effect like this. Like let's say let's say we have only five points here, and you give them random velocity. So one of them is going to be like this. Then yeah, this guy one is going to have um, small velocity. Then this one is going to have large one again. And this one is going to be like somewhere in the middle. So if you can kind of connect these things you are going to have a shape and once one city is going to have this kind of shape then the other city is going to have let's say let's say a shape like this these are going to be different shapes but if you have a lot of these let's say you have you know let's say let's say you have a thousand instead of five then you end up with something that is uniform and in here, there are bigger and shorter ones, for sure. And there are middle ones and all of this, you know, variation kind of exists inside, but they are overlapping so much that there's, they basically converge into one blob. So you want somehow to preserve all of these, uh, all of these information that you, that you had when you had fewer particles. So um, obviously you can't just emit from these five particles, uh, but you can you can do a two-stage emission. So you have five which are going to give you your initial information. So this is one is very long, but these all of these are very short, and this is the other one which is very long, and this happens to be the middle one. So this also already has some information. So there is a lot on the left, there is a lot on the right, there is almost nothing up. So this is a shape. So because you want to preserve this shape, then you emit secondary, not from the surface itself, but from the from this guy. And even if they are on the surface, if you, if, even if you snap them to the surface, they you want them to have this velocity. So eventually we end up with stuff that is like that. So the variation is, is inside these guys but you, you still you see we still have shape there is still discernible a lot on this side a lot on this side and not much on the other sides so yeah two or even three stages emission we do a lot um, it's very helpful because the other methods are um, a bit more cumbersome sometimes um, you can filter and get only a few of these and then give them very different velocity and so on but this has an elegance and a beauty in it. Doing it in two stages is very easy to control. You can control those, the, the different stages separately. It's very practical. Uh, definitely not the only way to do things, but you know it's a, it's a handy tool. So um, you you do we do this for the splashes because um, something that's kind of a rule for these emissions uh, when you have the thing happening in the. Um, in the most painful moment, which is just when it emits, it never looks good. So uh, one of the reasons we a lot of times don't emit smoke directly, we emit fuel that gets uh, some, some particles emitting fuel, some particles emitting temperature, then this becomes fire and the fire then emits smoke uh, because this gives the, the fluid just a little bit of time to, to develop before the smoke appears. And the, 
and this initial moment is the worst thing for you. So because in the beginning, you do not have any anything interesting uh, because you don't have a fluid. You have this uh, kind of, uh, you just have these emission particles and they, like all you can do is make them overlap in an interesting way. So they do not contribute too much individually. And when they overlap a little bit more, they contribute more. Uh, so you, they have a bit bigger radius. And either they have, you have big particles with uh, a very small density for individual particle, or you have high density, but all your individual particles are quite small. So they don't form these blobs. Then you have a lot of noise in here. The, the initial emission is tricky. Uh, but these are things which help. So, okay, uh, let me see. Okay, and then, of course, you know, with, with all the splashes and the, and the falling debris and everything, it will, it's getting heavy to render. You want to have this nice big geometry that has translucency with it and so on, so everything has to be instanced. And this is giving you another um, option to make something which is actually helpful. And um, when you see all of these things, the shapes and the sizes and so on, if all of this is controlled in, in the effects sim, that's not the best thing that you can do because you want generally to push the decisions down the pipeline or to enable the people down the pipeline to make decisions. And in effects and lighting, this means that you don't want to lock the size and the shape of something when the simulation happens. You want the lighting guy to be able to control, to make things a bit bigger if they need to, to, ma to make the shapes a bit higher resolution if they want to, to even uh, maybe uh, decrease the amount where it's a bit too much. So <clears throat> what we do is that we cache all these things into point clouds and we uh, give the point clouds to the lighting people and only in the lighting stage, they get replaced by the actual shapes. Uh, so this helps because the, then everything can be instanced. Uh, the caches are small <clears throat> and the lighting guys can actually <clears throat> have a lot of control on uh, the shapes and the sizes and the orientations even because we also give them the normal, uh, the, uh, the binormal and the tangent. So they, they can then build up orientation and they can use these vectors to maybe inc increase or decrease the rate of rotation. Uh, and I'm gonna, uh, I, I wanted to make a video to, to show this, but I didn't. So, so yeah, uh, this week I'm gonna try to do that. And that's a workflow which is very, which is very practical uh, because it enables the lighting guys to, uh, to address comments without going back one more step of the pipeline which is always making things slow. So instancing and uh, using point clouds to control this, these things is uh, a big time saver. Uh, okay. And then uh, the last thing, which, you know, kind of compounding on the translucencies and the transparencies of uh, all the, the snow and so on. So uh, it, it, Compounded on this, we had the helmets that are that are transparent, and we had to account for their refract refraction also in a lot of the shots. So maybe in a shot like this one, not as much. So we, I think we applied the setup here too. But in definitely shot in shots like this one where uh, you have the things falling behind the guys, they need to have some um, some refractive character. You know, like you can see a piece in here that's behind the, the guy's uh, helmet. So we ended up splitting these, these things off and using uh, various option to apply the, uh, the refractions only to the, to, to, to these kind of, uh, to, the, to the, what is it called, the, the, the ID. Uh, so the ID was getting refracted and then we kind of blended between these things in comp to uh, to layer the refraction below all the refraction, all, all the reflection that, that the helmets need to need to have. So, one more layer of uh, something, things that you need to think about. <laughs> but we ended up, it ended up looking looking quite nicely, which is which is 
always, you know, it then it ends up doing. There's always a solution. Um, so let's see what else. Um, now, of course, in the the plate inspired us to add a lot of snow, which is crawling near the ground, uh, and it's something that makes uh, uh, the the kind of usually static geometry that we had um, a bit more alive. And uh, as you as we just talked about with the with the polder, that adding another layer of uh, of dynamics is making things much more interesting. The crawling snow is the same thing. If you just have the static geometry, it looks dead and, and boring. But when you add some uh, some crawling snow on top of it, it uh, all of a sudden makes makes it much more alive and you know dynamic. Uh, and to do that, we couldn't really collide with the uh, with the actual geometry because it was heavily displaced. So uh, we don't really want the particles to go inside that either. So, you know, I said places they did and it was not a huge deal. Uh, but we just displaced a lower poly version of the, uh, the, of the ground mesh and we used this for a collision and we uh, pushed softly the, the particles into the ground. So they kind of getting pushed into there and uh, they bounce off, uh, but they can easily move upwards up the slope because this was the direction that the plate, that the snow in the plate already had, which was kind of another can of worms that we had the snow in the plate, then that you have to match uh, kind of behavior wise exactly. exactly. And uh, we blended turbulences. Uh, so that's something else that you always want to do. You don't To blend them is that in TV you can have a random number for each particle that's like let's say between zero and one and it can all the time change um, I think pretty much per frame you, you can get away because it, these are forces not good nothing drastic is going is going to happen to the particle and you get the the number uh, between zero and one and you apply this amount of force multiplied by something uh, from one of the of, of your turbulences and you do one minus this amount and you apply it to the other table. So you always have a mixture between the two. It, it always stays kind of the same amount. So things don't go out of control. And of course you want to, to put some drag on top because this enables you your particles to make smooth moves. Uh, if you just apply forces, like let's say your particle is flying in this direction and you apply a force in this direction, it's gonna do this. So, you know, it's not gonna, it's gonna make a turn uh, because the particle has this velocity and then you add this velocity. So if you kind of uh, put this vector on top of the ending of, of the previous vector, you end up with something like that. So, and this happens over time. So eventually you get a curve like this. And uh, when your particles become fast, you're never gonna get, you know, the swirly snowflake motions. So what you want to do is you want to have a lot of friction. So at every, so when the, the direction of the force change, changes in here, this component, the old component, is going to quickly be eaten out by the friction. So when you're already here, let's say this component, which was pushing in this direction is already kind of entirely eroded by the friction. And only this component is acting, which is going to make your particle make this, like a sharper turn. And with snowflakes, that's very important because otherwise you get these, you know, your frame is looking like this. Motion blur sticks. Uh, nobody wants to see this. People want, want to see this. Yeah. And to, to, to be able to make these turns, you want to have the, the, the vectors which, which are pushing the, the forces, uh, which are pushing the particles, to change them often. And you want to have plenty of uh, friction, which is eating up all of these excessive velocity that builds up. So yeah, you get nice snowflakes. And in TP, we just built um, boxes of these of these things. So we emit in, inside the box, and the particle shows up and it grows slowly over time, maybe for six frames, 
uh, starts at, at size zero and then for six frames it, it it goes up so it doesn't pop in it also fades down the size fades down when at the ending of the lifespan of the particle we're using value to, uh, to value you can uh, have your edge divided by lifespan and then use a curve like this to make your particle first grow and then shrink uh, so it never pops in and out of existence and apply this uh, mixing of uh, turbulences setup and uh, render it from a certain uh, distance and from, uh, from from closer and from farther and we just use this as generic snowflake uh, elements so uh, we just place them in, in all of the shots uh, at maybe two or three kind of distances and we have this depth of you know accumulated snowflakes i think i think in this breakdown you can see it quite well so here you have like the uh, the adding of the snowflakes and it makes the whole thing feel deeper you can't just have one layer because one layer makes it you know feel like you are just doing something in front of the camera uh, but yeah these things are uh, quick to simulate quick to render and then you can reuse them a lot uh, you have a thousand frames maybe or 500 frames of these and uh, you can just time time offset them uh, and use so uh, in all of the shots uh, the only time that we need to make a few extra of these elements was when we had the different um, time scales for different shots. So all the shots which are sped up, uh, which are slowed down, we need to have another layer because it doesn't feel like they were they were slowed down. Uh, so these all these exterior shots and stuff that I hope would be useful to you guys. Then there was this shot which had the destruction of the building. And a bunch of other things. So the section of the building was quite kind of classic setup. So we, we did the jointed mesh soft body kind of guide mesh. So uh, we had the silhouette of the building uh, that we replaced with a kind of cylindrical shapes because you know we wanted to have a close shape to um, to easily put uh, put kind of particles in the volume because just just doing it all on the surface. Uh, is not looking as interesting as doing it in the volume. It has more of a, when you do it in the volume, it has more of a jellyfish uh, kind of feel. You can make it much softer without breaking up the shell and it, 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 moves, it moves in a more organic way. Um, and we just made the ground sink underneath uh, the structure and kill, I think, uh, joints in some, in some uh, a random volume so if you imagine the building being like this and you have all of the regularly spaced joints in here you create a particle at some random place like let's say here and you say okay all of these in some radius of the of the particle um make all of the look at all the all the all the, um, the particles and if you if you find a joint which has one of, of its corners in a distance less than the radius to the to this particle and the other cor the other end is uh, in a distance more than the radius you break this joint because tp gives you you know the uh, the, the the positions of each of these uh, of the ends of the joint and you can just compare them to the radius and when one of them is more and the other one is less, you break the joint. So which means that only these joints are going to get broken. So this guy is going to get broken. This guy is going to get broken. But but this, for example, is going to stay intact. And these. Which means that you're going to get a clean kind of cut. And all of these stuff inside is going to remain jointed. And the other stuff is going to remain jointed. But this, this area is going to fall. And you can add the... Uh, you can add to the setup, uh, you can layer, you know, with the, let's say, the probability and threshold setup to have this happen, not immediately, but but, uh, but over time and get some kind of, uh, when it happens over time, you get like first these stairs and then these breaks and these breaks and you get kind of this, this kind of stuttered um, uh, motion, which is interesting, kind of slowly unzipping uh, 
kind of from doing the building. Uh, and you can do as many of these things as you like. You can place these, these uh, breaking uh, volumes at certain places and certain times, or you can just make it happen at random, uh, whatever. It's very easy to build a lot of random seeds and then just shop for uh, the seed that you like. Just find, you know, from the dozen, find whatever is interesting. Uh, so this is, yeah, very easy to set up and very practical. Um, then for the glass, we did exactly the setup that I was describing with the randomness and the, um, the, over, the randomness and over time uh, breaking. So uh, we start with some pieces of being broken and then over time more and more getting broken. Just like we have talked, we have to, we we told before, and um, the director was asking that we break more on the edges of uh, windows. So we used the VB uh, option to, uh, to to have cells where the particles are, so we can have a little bit more uh, breaking when the where the edges of the windows are because it's easy to just put particles on the on the frames of the windows that is not not too hard but what made the whole thing kind of you know snowy and fairy tale like and uh, dreamy was to add a lot of um, glittery very tiny debris uh, around the the main guys so the main debris is just falling but then it emits all of these uh, as small as possible uh, debris, which uh, has quite high reflectivity and uh, a bunch of extra masks, masks so the cop guys can control it, you know, the normals, so they can pick, like, let's say, only the normals which point in a certain direction and uh, give them more reflection and uh, delete the rest, so they can get this twinkle kind of uh, feel. Uh, so this was really helpful. Um, we, a lot of times when we make a big, something which has to feel big, one of the most reliable things is that you are looking for what is the smallest thing which is perceivable and you make your small things that big and the thing which is making it feel you know big scale and huge and so on is the difference between how big your big pieces are and how small your your pieces are if you don't have extremely small pieces you never get a good sense of scale so one of the th most important things we, we do is like find out what are the smallest pieces that you can have. And in, in the case here, it's like it's, it's this element. So let's see. So you can see this element is what makes the whole thing feel big, you know, just this. Without this, you get something which is looks like CG-ish kind of thing, and with this, it looks much less so. Um, so yeah, this is an important thing. Extremely small, as small as possible, and a lot of these things. Okay, uh, yeah, if you want to make glitter, if you end up doing this kind of special type of music videos, I guess this will also be handy. Uh, then. The last shot, kind of the biggest one that we did was this guy. So um, this was actually eventually split up in something which is pretty much two shots because it's so different on the inside and the outside. And um, the inside we were quickly, we found out two things which work very well. Uh, basically the other thing besides the rolling things that you can always do and always, it, uh, it always looks good is volumetric lights so you know you never have like you very rarely have too much volumetric lights uh, so because we wanted to tell the story that this thing is breaking uh, and uh, we want to have gradually more and more light come into the uh, into the interior we try to do this as much of it as possible you know there on the back side getting more lights to come in and with all the smoke that we filled <clears throat> the interior of the room, getting all the light in, which was a tricky balance because if you increase the density of that smoke, you the light doesn't um, go inside as much, and obviously you can't see uh, all of the action that is that is, that is happening. 
So you want to have it just at, at, uh, at the sweet spot where it's thick enough that the light rays are coming through and it's uh, thin enough that you can, you can see well behind that. And the other uh, tricky thing is with the, how your lights are working. And if you just have these point lights, then sometimes the streaks are just too sharp. So we ended up using V-Ray lights that have the directional parameter, which is making them uh, basically focus, make, making the rays more and more, uh, uh, yeah, parallel. So eventually, I think at 100%, the rays are completely parallel. So we used like 99.9% .9 and this make, made very soft and uh, like soft enough, but not too soft uh, 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 volumetric rays because, you know, I don't want every little piece to cast a volumetric show because you end up with this very comb like um, thing, which is unpleasant. So you want them to blur just a little bit and it was tricky to find the balance. Um, there, there is plenty of uh, inside. We just fill it up with a lot of stuff, which is falling. Um, obviously, uh, on the uh, on the outside, we also wanted to have quite a lot of these things, but eventually most of them got pulled out. And it was interesting to. I think one of the most interesting things was <coughs> that that slope at the front here, which is very close to the camera, and these things are quite difficult to deal with. Some make something which is extremely close uh, hold out, and it was interesting to shade it. Um, so we build this bunch of UV channels um, that are uh, kind of in, in, in going different directions. So we can uh, use cut up noises and, uh, and textures to make the whole thing uh, first, you have these very tiny uh, kind of bright and dark alteration, then have a gray to uh, to blue uh, gradient. So there's there's a few different gradients in there, then uh, more dense to the at the base and less dense at the top. And eventually, of course, it's volumetric because, you know, as we said, snow does not look good when it's not volumetric. And we, we tried to do this with geometry. Uh, and it never looked detailed enough and never looked kind of fluid enough. So we tried to do it with the fluid then, but we, it never had the, the clumpiness that snow has. Um, and eventually we ended up with something which is, it's not a grain solver because, you know, the grain solver is behaving too uh, kind of, they, they, uh, they feel, it feels a bit too pebble-like, so they're not, you know, it's not at the right balance between grainy and fluidy. So eventually what we ended up with is that we have these um, rigid bodies, which in between them, there is, um, there, are, there, are, there are particles that we emit, which we drive with the flow solver, or with a, with a fluid solver. So the the big pieces are driving are creating the are attaching the uh, the particles which are inside them, and they start moving. So these particles are creating the lumpy, the hard component, but then they carry with them the other particles around them in some band around them, which are under the influence of the fluid solver, and they, they create this fluid margin. And that's something else which is of becoming a vfx cliche but something which kind of always looks good you have this big thing this hard surface um, volume that you break up into into pieces and you leave a gap in between and this gap you can feel you can either break again or you can fill it up with the fluid so when you fill fill this up with fluid then uh, in this case, it was like that, you know, these things start moving, this piece and this piece start moving, and then they squeeze the fluid in between them, and it ends up, you know, uh, creating some interesting shapes. So the fluid kind of goes like that, and you end up with something that is much more interesting and um, and exciting than, 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 than the, uh, these, these other guys. But um, because you wanted this thing to slowly dissolve, what we ended up doing is that 
uh, as I said, these <coughs> these these pieces have uh, particles born inside them. So in the beginning, they are be attached to, to, to the large pieces, and the large pieces are moving just you know even have dynamics. They just they just you know go in a there in a in a uh, kind of in a random direction. So they they go away from each other. But over time, this this guy shrinks. So it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And uh, these particles which are which are becoming which are getting left outside of this volume, they get transferred into the into the fluid solver. So as this thing shrinks, and we just we just do this by looking at the at the nearest position and the nearest uh, point between the, the this particle and the surface. Uh, and when when this nearest point becomes very low, then uh, when the distance becomes very low, low, then we release them. So as this shrinks, the, the the particles go into the fluid solver. So you get the feeling that over time the snow, the big snow clump, is just getting dissolved. And this is what ended up working for this for this fact. It was quite a trip to get this going. But yeah, it, it kind of works eventually. Uh, something else which was interesting that we did here uh, on the lighting side is that we went um, into splitting off all the lights and sending them in comp as uh, as light selects, each individual light. So then what you end up doing is that instead of having in comp just a balance between the different components, you know, the diffuse and the reflectivity and the uh, SSS and so on. You have components for each individual light. So at this point, we don't have the very next light selects, which are much more flexible now. So we only had the um, uh, combined beauty components for each light, but it still allowed us to dial in how each uh, to dial in a, a look based on how much each light contributes. Uh, and because there's there's plenty of lights here, so there's light that is coming from the outside, light that is lighting up this area, and lights on the ceiling, and how much this should be uh, lit, and and so on and so on. So uh, it was much easier to give the comp guy just uh, a, a tool to dial how much each of these lights is gonna contribute instead of uh, doing all of this in lighting, and it ended up saving a lot of time actually. And um, just easily uh, giving us easily tweakable looks. So that was funny. Um, the the glass here was funny. How to make this kind of safety glass? So we tried with the shader, uh, but the shader didn't work because it end, it ends up kind of if you look if you look at it from the from the front, like let's say you have this kind of glass and you make the shader kind of feel shattered. But when you look at it from the side, it you don't have all of these glints here because all that you have done is that you have changed the surface. So eventually, what we ended up uh, making is that we have a big bunch of cells, kind of just like this, that we stick together. And again, these are inside in the volume of a of one big rigid body. So we have from the rigid body we have the information that that we know how to align. So we just align them, but these are different cells, and each of them is an actual separate object. So when you render them, they behave like that, and uh, because they spin so much, it was it was important for us to to get this to get them looking nice when they spin so they had to reflect all the light and pick up all the glints uh, and so on uh, so nothing worked as well as this thing worked uh, and we have again this two layer uh, approach where there is this big rigid body simulation of that has you know a few hundred fragments maybe not too many and then we have a second layer which is in this case clustering all of these tiny uh, glass shards into the the big pieces because you you do want the big pieces like you can't just simulate with the 
with the small guys because you're not going to get all of these all of these holes and uh, the, the bigger pieces you don't want to have everything noisy and just tiny uh, so you want the thing to behave like big pieces you know like like what you can see here but you don't want then the big pieces to behave like these big flat geometries so yeah instancing uh, of course instancing because these are then i think hundreds of thousands of these tiny uh, shards um, that, that was interesting okay i didn't speak much about the backgrounds but they they were i mean not that they were trivial they changed they did change a lot uh, but they're kind of obvious we make this made these wedges of like let's say camera is pointing in this direction and we make a wedge uh, that is getting again filled by these islands of icy ground that we have and they just overlap in some kind of interesting way and we have a shuffle and we make another wedge for another shot which is camera is, is looking at in another direction because these are again so heavy that we can't really yeah, we can't really have them have too many of them um, we had some atmosphere into, into the distance and some um, clouds that we made race across the ground using the uvs only and just doing this in comp which helped out a lot let me check my list Um, yeah, I think something which is important to point out, you know, one of these, like, what should you do that always looks good is that you should always have stuff interacting. Uh, like there is pieces here which are falling from the ceiling and it never looks good until you add the pieces which are hitting the floor. So anytime that you can have interaction between elements you should do that and it always is a, is a, is a good bet that you know things are going to end up looking looking better uh, when you don't have interaction it's just less convincing that things belong in, in, a, in a common world the interaction is just telling you why that these things are together in this place it's not just uh, it's not just a matte painting Okay, that should be you have strung you out at the end of your patience. Uh, cool. Uh, let me see the chat because I know this is annoying. The kind of picture in picture is not really working that this well. Um, Uh, at Khaled, like why not using Max to show us clearly? I would never be able to tell you that this many things. And you know, something with cash and uh, yeah, it would need a lot of preparation time. Uh, but definitely we, what we do is that we are um, stripping down assets from the, um, at the end of the show, basically we strip down the assets that we don't own and we have a, a simple version of, um, of an effect and we publish it into a, the, our library project. So this way we can reuse the setup a bit later. And these are things that we can actually show. So uh, I'm gonna check out the, the folders there and see what the good stuff is. Uh, it, there's not that much time in the, in the day that I have anymore, uh, but definitely I think, you know, once a week there's something cool that we can show. Um, Rob is asking if it was difficult to texture and light the layers of snow and finer snow. Um, it was mostly the, the displacement that was carefully textured, I would say. And the displacement gave us enough detail that we only made this big because otherwise it becomes becomes a bit too homogeneous and, and interesting uh, but again this is something that we eventually moved to compositing uh, because uh, I think you can see here let me see you can see how the how this works uh, so this is something that goes out of the light of the render so it goes out of the render like this let's say 
And then this is something that the composting guys add. So all of these, this darkened area in here is something that we just give the, our composting people the UVs and then they, they, they have a noise that apply on these UVs. But actually, yeah, that, that, that's a good thing to ask because it's not just the UVs because uh, it would be a flat area. So what we do is that we use the normals in 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 uh, both in camera space and in world space. I think here we use the, the world space normals, and we make make the mask uh, with I think the normals which are only pointing down the slope. Uh, so <clears throat> because the the displacement is making a surface which is like quite quite craggy like this, and if you only take the normals which are pointing in this direction then you have something which is varied because you paint this and this and this and you, you don't paint these areas so you end up with this high frequency uh, variation so this helped us a lot in getting the the lower frequency variation that we uh, offloaded from uh, lighting so this so this was yeah this was very helpful Uh, Piresh said that he missed some parts. I think Piresh is going to be, the, the, all of this, this stuff is going to end up in, um, it's going to be posted as a video, so don't worry about that. Okay, so I think we should be having dinner, and I'm sure you guys all over the world must be getting hungry or something like that. You have better stuff to do. Uh, so, yeah, let's wrap things up uh, and keep asking questions. Um, all of us are going to be answering. It's a, it's a very helpful community. And uh, yeah, see you around. It's going to be many of these things. Thank you, guys. Bye.